at your neighbor, look at them and say, you was in the right place. I'm so glad you're here tonight online. I'm glad you're where you are and tuning in and joining us. And, and tonight we actually launch our Easter series. It's hard to believe that we just, it seems like we just finished Christmas and here we are and the Easter is upon us. And, uh, and so we always like a couple of weeks out, like to get us thinking about Easter and in, in the process of understanding how important that time is for believers and in the, the opportunity we have to celebrate. So we're starting a series today called Words from the cross. And, and we're going to look at some words that Jesus uttered, some of his final words as he hung on the cross. And as he was suffering, and, and those words as they went forward, there's actually seven phrases if you read it in your Bible. Now, we're not going to unpack all of those seven phrases, but they're actually some of the most famous last words ever spoken. And we're going to unpack some of them and, uh, and see, even though they were spoken a little over 2,000 years ago, how they still speak and resonate to every single one of us today. So how many ready to dive into the Word? Amen. Amen. Three people. Okay, the rest of you are going to get on board. I tr trust me. I believe it with all my heart. Our heart is for this series that come on Good Friday and Easter Sunday that you just don't come to church alone, that you actually bring somebody. Can I tell you, it is the easiest time ever to invite people to church is at Easter time. They actually feel like it's uh, an obligation to go to church on Easter. It's like, well, I must do this. It's the right thing to do. And so we believe that, hey, let's use that to get them in here to hear the gospel and maybe the their hearts and lives are radically changed forever and they're introduced to Jesus. How many think that'd be pretty cool? Yeah, come on. Online, I hope you're like jumping up and down in your living room and getting so excited. Um, but here we go. We're going to start in Luke chapter 23. And like I said, we're going to read a portion of scripture here. Then we're going to journey through one of the first statements Jesus made. Actually, the very first statement he makes from the cross. But Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 32, says this. Two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. And when they came to the place called the skull, they nailed him to a cross. And the criminals were also crucified, one on his left and one on his right. Now, let's just hit the pause button there for, for a moment. And I think we need to review what has happened up until this point. If we understand you read the Bible, it clearly states that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life, everlasting life. So Jesus came with a purpose. Jesus came with an, a, a purpose to die. When you think about it, he came with a purpose to die. And so if we were to recap his life really quick up to this point, he comes, he's born of a virgin, he's raised. At the age of 30 now, he goes down and he's baptized by a guy named John the Baptist. And the heavens open up over him and the, and the spirit descends upon him, says, this is my beloved son and who I am well pleased. And he goes out and he begins to do three years of incredible ministry. He begins to heal sick bodies and cast out demons and raise dead people. He begins to challenge the religious and so much so he stirs up that that everyone thought, hey, is this our Messiah? And they're just saying, there's no way this guy can be our Messiah. He's a lunatic. He's crazy. And so they find a way. They want to kill him. They want to have him killed. And so they find a way to try to bring some false accusations and charges against him. One of his closest friends betrays him and turns him over for 30 pieces of silver. And then he's taken through this kangaroo court, a midnight court. He's taken in he's escorted and the trial starts at around midnight and they're hurling all these accusations and all their stories are making no sense whatsoever and they can't even get their story straight and and even the leaders are saying well, we don't really find grounds to really do this and so they bring him before Pilate and Pilate says this guy's innocent man he doesn't deserve death and they're just yelling and screaming and he says well I'll release him it's customary for me to release a prisoner for you during your your feast and he goes no no I'll release this guy, Jesus, they said, no, no, release Barabbas, who was a convicted murderer, a killer. They released him and they said, what about Jesus? And they said, crucify him. Crucify him. So they have him whipped and he's led to Calvary where he is there. And all throughout this process, when you're reading it through scripture, Jesus isn't saying a lot. He's not trying to defend himself. He's not trying to say, hey, you guys are wrong. You're crazy. You're messed up. He's not saying any of that stuff. He remains 
silent. And then all of a sudden he's on the cross between two criminals and his lips start to move. And all of a sudden people are probably excited, hey, Look, like, is he going to say something? Is he, is he going to say something? Is he going to curse those who are abusing him? Is he going to go, call down hate upon them? Is he going to pray to God for relief from his physical pain? Is he going to do something like that? Jesus uttered the very first words that we are going to look at from the cross. And there are probably some of the most unbelievable words that we would think that would come out of his mouth at this time, at this space, in what is going on in his life. And these are the words that he says in verse 34. He says, Father, forgive them. Forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. How many know if you were up on the cross, and those are probably not the first words coming out of your mouth. Right? Those are probably not the first words, but here, Jesus, the suffering Savior, who is innocent, who is perfect, who is, who is spotless, in the middle of his pain, after being whipped, after being beaten, have, have a crown of thorns shoved on his head and a robe wrapped around him and then ripped off as his flesh was drying and the blood was caked on and it's ripped off and then he's naked on the cross. Nailed, nails in his wrists and in his feet. And now he begins to pray, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Those words hold so much significance for you and I. And I think we got to look at a couple of thoughts and, and points that I want to bring out as we understand how important these words are. Because with these words, Jesus actually begins to fulfill a 700-year-old prophecy that was spoken way back in the book of Isaiah. 700 years before Jesus ever came onto the scene, this was prophesied. This exact event was prophesied in Isaiah 53. is actually known as the forbidden chapter. Because true Jews, when they, when they use their Bible, they only use the Old Testament. They don't believe in the New Testament. And actually when they read the book of Isaiah, they don't read Isaiah chapter 53. Because the whole chapter is about Jesus. And they don't believe the Messiah has come yet. So they call it the forbidden chapter. And they actually don't even read it. It's in their book, but they don't even read it. And it says this in Isaiah 53, 12. He poured out his life unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors. What does that mean? A criminal on his right and a criminal on his left. And the Bible actually says he bore the sin of many and that he actually made intercession. And that word intercession is a big word simply meaning he prayed. That's what he did. He prayed. He prayed for, for you. He prayed for I. He prayed for everybody. He said, Father, forgive them. And with those words, he's actually fulfilling a 700-year-old prophecy. That's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. When you look at the 36 prophecies that come true just from Jesus on the cross, the probability of one of those prophecies coming true, probability of one it would be like filling the province of Ontario two feet deep with loonies and taking one toonie and throwing it into the middle and saying, you have one chance to find the toonie. How many know that's like, how do you think you're going to find the toonie? Let me go over to Sudbury. Maybe it's over in Sudbury. No, nothing good comes out of Sudbury, right? right. No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Bad pastor. Bad pastor. <laughs> So that's just a probability of one of those prophecies coming true. All 36 of them coming true would be like reaching out into the universe and having one shot to grab a specially marked atom that's got a little X on it. You have one shot to reach out into the universe. That's the probability of 30, all of those prophecies coming true. And we see all of them fulfilled in Jesus' final hours on the cross. So when you begin to think of the importance of this, of this prophecy being fulfilled, another reason why I think this is so important, because Jesus, Jesus actually models something for you and I. He modeled the importance of prayer. He modeled the importance of prayer. He was a person of prayer. When you look at his life, when you go back to Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, after he starts his ministry, and he, and he actually said, when you pray, pray this way. And he actually taught them how to pray. When you look at the significance of that, how did Jesus start his ministry on earth? He prayed. 
And now we see in his final hours, how does he end his ministry on earth? He prays. Again, he prays. He's modeling the significance of prayer. And who did he pray for? He prayed for the most unlikely people, his enemies, the ones who have beaten him and whipped him. And I think that's encouraging. It should be encouraging to us on a couple of levels. Number one, because we probably all have those people in our life that we think there is no chance that they're ever going to come to know Jesus. They, they, we have friends and family members that we think they are too far gone, that they are so unreachable, that nothing is ever going to happen. They're never going to come into a relationship with God. And I think here's Jesus praying for these right here. He's saying, Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. God, would you arrest their hearts? And, and he's praying that they would find forgiveness. That they're going to find truth. That they're going to find life in God. He's actually praying for them. And I think that models for you and I. Because I know this. We give up way too easily when we pray. Look at your neighbor and say, you give up way too easily. We give up way too easily when we pray. And I think this models for you and I that no matter how far gone we think somebody is, we should never, ever, 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 ever give up praying. We should never stop praying. We should never give up. We learned last week with Hannah. Hey, one more time. I'm going to come one more time. I'm going to pray. And if you tuned into the devotion this morning, it was kind of bam moment. It hit me and it said, and God remembered her prayer. Can I tell you, God has not forgotten one of your prayers. And, and sometimes we think prayers that have gone unanswered, God has not forgotten them. And at the right time, I believe with all my heart, if we are diligent and we keep praying and we never give up, we can begin to see some amazing things happen. Jesus didn't see what he wanted to see happen in that moment, but he still prayed. He modeled a life of prayer. And then I think the last thing that what we see here is he actually models or he reveals humanity's greatest need, forgiveness. He says, in this moment, I find it interesting what Jesus didn't pray for, pray for. God, would you bless these people? God, would you provide for these people? God, would you give these people a home? Would you give them provision? Would you give them breakthrough? Would you give them really nice camels and, and nice goats and donkeys? No, he says, Father, forgive them. Their greatest need, your greatest need, my greatest need is forgiveness. Period. That is the greatest need of humanity. That's why Jesus, before he went to the cross, when he gathered with his closest, his 12 closest people, and he said at the, at the table, he said, this is my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. He understood that, hey, Jesus revealed the greatest need. Father, forgive them for they don't even know what they're doing. I think what's sad and upsetting, I think to me as an observer, as a believer, is how many broken and damaged relationships that we see, forget outside the church, inside the church. How many broken, damaged relationships that we see. And it's, even in a group this size, it's not a very big group. It's not a very big group, but even in a group this size, I can tell you there are a lot of people who are wounded deeply, who are carrying some hurts and some bitterness. And, and there's, there, there might be guys that don't trust Girls, and there might be girls that don't trust guys, and, and, and maybe it's because somebody made a vow to you and promised something to you, and they betrayed you, and, and they shattered that, that promise, and maybe it is the pain that, that so many kids are experiencing today now because parents' marriages, that when you think about a divorce rate in the church, is just as high as outside the church. So we see so many kids where, where they're, they're experiencing pain and, and disappointment because... 
moms and dads are breaking up and maybe it's fathers that were neglectful and mothers that were verbally abusive and then you begin to throw a little alcohol in the mix and throw a little drugs into the mix and, and throw a little sexual addiction into the mix and now you've got this recipe for an incredible disaster and a bigger mess and you think man horrible ungodly things are happening in our world today to innocent people people are being molested and, and people are being abused they're, they're being yelled at they're being told I wish I never had you in our culture in society today we see siblings fighting with each other their own flesh and blood that haven't spoken to each other for years we see people in the church getting angry at Christians and say well you know what I have no problem with God but that other person that person that calls himself a Christian yeah I've got a problem with that we've got people who call themselves ministers who do ungodly things incredibly ungodly things and give Jesus such an incredible bad name. We have tons of people who would call themselves followers of Christ walking around with these huge wounds, broken, broken relationships, struggling, hurting. Our society, can we just say this, is pretty messed up. Our society is so messed up. Then you want to throw a little bit of COVID into the mix, right? Hey, you're having a hard time in your marriage. Now you can't even leave your house. <laughs> Stupid COVID. <laughs> People are losing their minds. People are, are struggling and hurting so bad and relationships are being torn and fractured. So what do you do when you've been hurt like that? What do you do when, when you've been wronged? And what do you do if you find yourself on the end of one of those relationships? And I think the most important thing that we can do, Jesus models it. He says, pray. We need to learn how to pray. And I, I find it fascinating that, that this is the first topic we look at because it kind of flows so nicely with our last series. All on what? Forgiveness. All on what? Not being offended. And here we have Jesus, the ones who hurt him the most, that beat him, that whipped him, that betrayed him. And he says, Father, forgive them. Because he says this in Luke chapter 6. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. Pray for those who mistreat you. And you look at who is mistreating Jesus. Well, we had the, the Jews, we had the Pharisees, the Sadducees, we had the, the Roman soldiers. And what did he do? He prayed for them. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. And we like, oh yeah, I'll pray for them. I'll pray for them, all right. God, smite them. God, I pray you would wipe them off the face of the earth. God, I pray you would totally obliterate them and destroy them. God, that lightning would strike their house and blow them all up. We're like, yeah, that's my kind of prayer, right? How many know when we're angry, we can pray really good angry prayers, right? But no, no. Bless those and pray for those who, who mistreat you. Think about, when you think about, really truly think about the context and the culture that Jesus was raised in. Jesus was a Jew. He was born in a system that was known for being under the law. Now, he didn't come to abolish the law. He actually came to fulfill the law. But according to the law, in the life that Jesus was raised, it was a pretty fair system. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Right? Hey, you knock somebody's eye out. They're like, hey, come here. I got to knock your eye out. Like somebody knocks your tooth out. It's like, stand still. Let me bop your tooth out. It was an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. It was a fair system. Now, he was also living in a near a Roman Greco world where the Romans actually worshipped. You know, one of the gods they worshipped was the God of revenge. See, if you ever did a Roman wrong, they were very creative at revenge. They actually worshipped a God of revenge. They were actually famous for it. If you did something to a Roman and they were seeking revenge, they were going to take it out like 10 times worse. So think about this. Jesus born into an environment known as an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Knew a society of revenge. Yet the whole time he was in control. 
The whole time, never once did he speak a word of retaliation. Never once did he say, oh my goodness, watch what I'm going to do to them. Watch Michael, Gabriel, get the popcorn. This is going to be good. Watch this, baby. You ain't seen nothing yet. Father, forgive them because they don't even know what they're doing. They don't even know what they're doing. There's some of you here today, you've had relationships and that they're, they've, they were important relationships, but they've been severed for years and maybe somebody did something wrong to you and you're carrying a grudge and a hurt. And, and, and maybe what they did was really wrong and, and, and they deserve punishment. But guess what God calls you and I to? A higher standard, a higher level. He doesn't lower the bar to here and say, well, get your revenge and then come on back up here. No, no, no. He calls us to a higher standard. Father, forgive them. Forgive them for they don't even know what they're doing. He says in Matthew chapter 5, you've heard it said it was to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's what used to be said. But I tell you, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Rob, can't you just talk about the resurrection? Can't you talk about Jesus coming back to life? Why you got to do something like this? Why you got to point it out like this and, 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 and make me look at it and say, well, I know I've got some bitterness and some resentment against some people. Now, what am I supposed to do with that? Father, Forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. We're called to forgive. Jesus modeled it on the cross. The very first words out of his mouth, the very first words from the cross, he models forgiveness. Father, forgive them, for they know what they don't know what they're doing. And I think another thing we can learn from this scripture is that. Jesus's prayer really teaches us that we should actually be looking for restoration. That should be our heart. Our heart should be for restoration. The Bible makes it clear when you read the Bible, it says this. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and to give the enemy a foothold. That word foothold is the Greek word for legal residence or room. When we let the sun go down on our anger, we actually give the enemy a legal right to reside in our heart. And he will more than happy take up residence. He will more than happy say, you invited me in, I ain't leaving. I ain't leaving, I'm gonna make you mad, I'm gonna make you bitter, I'm gonna make you resentful, I want to just make this horrible for you. If we're being honest, you ever notice how easy it is to get mad? How easy it is to get frustrated. How easy it is to take up an offense and to be hurt. How come it's not easy for us to forgive? Honestly, if, if we have Jesus, right? And I'm talking to believers. And, and if, you, if, if you don't have Christ in your heart, then yeah, it makes it a little bit harder. But as a believer, why is it still so hard to forgive? Why do we have so many believers at odds? And, and not talking to each other. And maybe you won't even, well, I'm not going there because so-and-so's there. Or I'm not doing this because so-and-so's there. And, and, and we call ourselves believers? We call ourselves that, well, I have a right to hold on to this. Because I'm godly in all my other areas, so I have a right to do this. No, 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 Father, forgive them. What would happen if we started to release forgiveness in our lives, in our relationships? Maybe it's you got a marriage that's not where it's supposed to be. Instead of just kind of heaping more coal or throwing gasoline on the fire, what if you got off your stinking butt and did something about it? Maybe apologize, repent, forgive. 
Imagine what that could do to move the ball forward. And maybe you got kids, it's a son or a daughter, and you're not on speaking terms. And, 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 and it's going to them and saying, hey, mom and dad, we're, we're sorry for what we've done. Or maybe you're a kid and, and you're holding bitterness and resentment against your mom and your dad. It's going to them, mom and dad, forgive me for not honoring. You're not doing what, man, the, the fifth commandment said, for not honoring you. And, and, and so I can have years added to my life. And I think, how do we even forgive practically? Because we really suck at it. We really do. If we're being honest, right? We, I, I would think this would be something that every single person in this room struggles with. Now, I've seen some incredible people do things right. And even in this church, when they're struggling with things, they actually take the right steps and they and they move the ball forward and they look for restoration and they look for saying, hey, listen, I want to make things right. But how do you forgive when you don't even feel like it? How could we like a Jesus nailed to a cross utter those words, Father, forgive them. Ah, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. I think Colossians 3 sheds a lot of light on it. Colossians 3 verse 13. It says, bear with each other and forgive whatever. Not just some. Whatever grievances you may have against one another. So that tells me right there, I don't have the right to hold on to anything. I don't have the right to hold on to it. That I need to bear with one another and forgive whatever it is. No matter how big or how small. I need to forgive whatever grievances I have against one another. And it's when I do that that I can begin to move forward. Because here's the deal. How do we forgive? Just the way the Lord forgave us. We just do it. We just do it. Well, no, no, it's, it's got to be more complex than that. It can't be that easy. Actually, yeah, it is that easy. Because let's take the honest truth, the ugly truth, that if you were to take all the wrongs that you did, if I was to take all the wrongs that I did or that someone did against me and, or someone did against you, and if you were to add them all up and multiply them by 100, they actually don't even come close to the ways that you and I have wronged God. They don't even come close. So how do we forgive? Just as the Lord forgave us. Because the Bible says if we're faithful to confess our sins, God is faithful to forgive our sins. And it's not a process. It happens like that. Father, forgive them. For Give them for they don't know what they're doing. Why is forgiveness so important? Why is this the very first thing that Jesus utters from the cross? And I think we need to pay really close attention to why that is the very first phrase. Because I know if I was there, I'd be like, God, what are you doing to me? Dad, come on. I did nothing wrong. But he says, Father, forgive them. Because I think Jesus said it in Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your Father in heaven will forgive you. Why did he model that? Why is forgiveness so important? Because if we cannot forgive one another, God's not going to forgive you. If you don't forgive, then God will not forgive. Think about that one. That's one of those scriptures that we just kind of glance over. It actually says it. It's written right there. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. I think that's why this very first phrase, the very first words from the cross Father, forgive them holds so much importance for you and I today because we're called to forgive. Period. Not forgive if, 
they change if they take the first step, if they, they extend a hand first, if they extend the olive branch. No, no, we're called to forgive, period. We are called to forgive. See, when man was at his worst, God's son was at his best. He was at his best. And he said, Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. See, when we think about it, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for you and for me. And the Bible actually says when we believe in that, when we confess that with our mouth and believe it in the heart, it says then we are saved and our sins are forgiven. And then we have the opportunity, the obligation to forgive whatever grievances we hold against one another. My prayer as we kick off this Easter season is that you can begin to walk in forgiveness. Because I'm telling you, man, what I have seen happen in this last year is so divisive inside the church. So divisive where, where we're setting up camps and, and this camp against this camp. And it shouldn't be like that. And I think how amazing that the very first words that Jesus says from the cross, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Imagine this Easter season if you're willing to release to forgiveness to maybe that one person. Maybe you got that one person that just is you're like, man, I wish I never see them again. If you have that feeling towards anybody, can I just go out on a limb and say, that's probably the person you need to forgive. <clears throat> that's probably a step you need to take. Because if you're not willing to forgive sins that have been done against you or things that wrongs have been against you, then your father in heaven, he's not gonna forgive you. Don't just glance over that scripture. Let that one sit in your heart. Let it resonate in your heart. I'm so thankful that I don't get upset or offended easily. I have a, a, a very, 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 very long fuse. My wife doesn't even understand it sometimes. If something can happen, I'm like, I don't care. She's like, really? I'm like, I'm good. That doesn't bother you? We get it. Nope. No, it, 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 it really doesn't. And I know that's a good thing and it's a bad thing. Uh, it's a good thing because I don't get upset or offended very easily. I really don't. I really don't. I can step back into almost any relationship. And there's some, there's some that, that you know what, God will, is and will continue to work on my heart by saying I'm perfect. What? Again, just ask my wife. I'm almost there. I made her two coffees today. <laughs> Yeah, sainthood right here. Yeah, absolutely. We all got work to do. And I know there's still things in my heart. And when I get around somebody that I haven't been around in a while, and all of a sudden something begins to rear its ugly head in me where there's maybe some resentment and some bitterness, you know, the first thing I do is, God, what is it in me that's causing that? Do I have some unforgiveness? Do I've got some bitterness that I'm holding on to that I haven't? Do I need to release forgiveness here? And if I do, then, then I take that moment and say, hey, listen, man, I, I just need to ask for your forgiveness. I've been holding on to some stuff here and, 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 and I, I just want to wanna let it go. So I, I need to ask your forgiveness for holding on to that. And that's hard. Sounds easy to do until you have to do it. Sounds easy until you have to look somebody in the face that betrayed you and backstabbed you and gossiped about you. And you have to say, hey, I forgive you. And you can't cross your fingers when you do it. You can't cross your toes. But imagine if we would begin to live a life of forgiveness, what that would look like in the church. Can I tell you, I believe it would make the church a lot more attractive than what it is right now. Jesus is not the, the offensive thing for people. 
He's not. God's word, it's hard, but when, when, when you understand the love that it comes from, people get that. You know what turns people off from church? Us. Us. Look at your neighbor and say, it's your fault. <laughs> what an encouraging message on Easter, eh? <laughs> the pastor said it's my fault. It's all of our faults. Why? Because we don't know how to forgive. And I think it's a forgotten art. And that's why the first words from the cross are, Father, forgive them. Jesus models that not only do we live a life of prayer, but we live a life of forgiveness. Every single day. Every single day. Why don't you stand with me and let's pray. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and I'm going to pray for us. Father, Lord, we thank you for tonight. God, we're excited as we kind of launch into this series. And, and it's almost Easter time is, is when the rest of the world is kind of open to hear about you. And Father, we don't want to miss that opportunity. God, we want the church to be the most attractive place going because it's full of people who love you. God, I know your word says that if we lift you up, that you would draw all men unto yourselves. And so, God, we want to do that this Easter season at Bikers Church. We want to lift your name up high so that you would draw all men and women unto you. And, God, we know it starts by living a life of forgiveness. God, forgive us for holding on to things. And God, we even just came through the whole series and learning about not to be offended and, and to release that forgiveness. But God, we still hold on to it. God, I pray that today is the day that we release it. That we would learn to forgive. That we would learn to let go of bitterness and resentment. God, those hurts, those disappointments that we've had in others because of things they've done or said to us. God, that we would release the forgiveness that's been kept keeping us bound in missing out on the fullness of life. God, we know we didn't deserve it, but you forgave us. So help us to extend it to those that we may not feel they deserve it, but God, because you did it for us, we need to do it for others. And God, I pray for those people in this place tonight that are struggling with that. God, that they've been so wrong, that they've been so hurt. Lord, I pray even right now, healing over their hearts. God, as, as they move forward and, and try to take a step out of that hurt and that disappointment, and the enemy would try to get them to stay put, Father, I pray that that voice would be silenced and they can take a step in your love, in your mercy, in your grace, and they begin to extend that to others. God, we know that it's, it's going to be hard and it's going to be difficult, but we know this, that with you, it's possible. Because you modeled it for us and you did it for us. So Jesus, this Easter season, help us to live a life where we forgive others quickly. That we don't let bitterness or resentment take root in our heart. That, that when we're hurt, when we're offended, God, we're going to let it go. And we're going to release forgiveness. Because that's what you did for us. Jesus, we so desperately need you. Help us to be the men and women you are calling us to be. To live a life of integrity. To live a life that is not going to lower the standard, but we're going to raise the bar. And we're going to be all you're calling us to be. Maybe you're here tonight or you're watching tonight and you've never said yes to Jesus. And, and maybe you just started coming out because you heard we're doing an Easter series. And you thought, okay, maybe I'll just go and, and check out and do the kind of church thing for, for Easter and do my religious duty. And not understanding that the sole purpose that we celebrate Easter is because God so loved the world. That he sent his son to die for you and to die for me. So we can live a full life. Because a life without of Jesus is a messed up life. And you're figuring that out on your own. Because you're trying things and they're leaving you empty and void. And maybe you thought it was going to be found in money and it doesn't satisfy. Maybe you thought it was going to be found in a relationship and it doesn't satisfy. Maybe you thought it was going to be found in the substance and it leaves you wanting more. Maybe you thought it was going to be found in a job 
and it just leaves you kind of climbing and in that rat race of life thinking there's got to be more and his name is Jesus. And he's everything you need. He's everything you've been longing for. He's everything you've been looking for. And you can meet him tonight by simply doing what the scriptures say. Confessing with your mouth and believing with your heart. Confessing that he's Lord and believing that God raised him from the dead. That he not only died for your sin, but he rose again and defeated sin. So if you're here tonight or watching online, you would say, that's me. I need Jesus, man. My life is empty. It's void. I'm desperate. I need hope. I need restoration. I need Jesus. Rob, would you pray for me tonight? And I would say, I would gladly pray with you tonight. I'm just going to ask you really quick, if that's you, raise your hand so I can pray with you. If there's anybody, thank you. Thank you online. I'm going to lead us in a prayer, and we'll all pray this together. Let's say, Jesus, thank you that you died for me. And I acknowledge that I'm messed up, and I need you. Tonight, be my Lord. Be my Savior, so I can live for you, so I can honor you, so I can serve you all the days of my life. Tonight, I give you my life. In your wonderful name, I pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Bless you guys. Go and forgive somebody. All right. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you again next week.